Hello and welcome to session seven of our eight-part series on praying with the Gospel of John. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at the passion and death of Jesus as it's portrayed in the fourth gospel. Um, before we begin, let's begin with prayer. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You might recall that at the end of chapter 12, in the very last part of the Book of Signs, John uh, tells us uh, that Jesus' hour has come. And beginning with chapter 13, with the account of the foot washing at the Last Supper, John uh, describes a, a trajectory of Jesus uh, returning to the Father and, um, and being glorified by the Father. Even in his crucifixion, he is lifted up so that he might draw all people to himself. And so this process of glorification begins with the final supper and continues through his crucifixion and resurrection. So we saw him at supper with his disciples. We saw him offering the example of humble service by washing their feet. We witnessed him identifying who it was that was going to betray and giving the bread dipped in the bowl to Judas Iscariot, who goes out in the night uh, to arrange for his betrayal and arrest. Uh, we saw him uh, uh, then speaking with his disciples, uh, giving them a final address, trying to console them in their anguish and their fear of the future, uh, promising them that he was going away, but he would come again, and uh, telling them that uh, he was going away in order to prepare a place for them, and he would come again and gather them to himself, and that they too would be uh, joined with him in these heavenly places. He also promises the Holy Spirit to be their protector and defender and to be their teacher, to lead them in the path of truth. And then uh, following this uh, uh, lengthy discourse, uh, Jesus offers a heartfelt prayer for his disciples, asking that they might be unified, um, asking that they might be protected from uh, persecution and uh, praying for not only his disciples, but for all those who would come after, um, that God would protect and keep them. And so we come, uh, we come here now to the uh, beginning of the story of, the, of Jesus' actual passion and the events leading to his death. And before we begin, I just want to draw a contrast We've noted all along that John's uh, take on things is quite different than the uh, interpretation of things that we read in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the Synoptic Gospels have a tie between them. Uh, there are parts of those Gospels that are almost identical, uh, um, have been copied or passed on uh, to the various authors. John's account is quite different in a number of ways, and we are going to see that again in the uh, account of his passion and death. Uh, for example, uh, the scene at Gethsemane. In, in the Synoptic Gospels, we have Jesus uh, in anguish, and deeply troubled and distressed uh, in Gethsemane, and he uh, takes his uh, disciples to the garden in order to pray. 
and he pleads with the Father that this cup be taken from him, if that's possible. Uh, the Gospel writers use graphic uh, language, like his sweat uh, was like drops of blood. And meanwhile, the disciples keep falling asleep. Three times they are asked to watch with him, but they fall asleep. So the Synoptic Gospels, the emphasis is on the suffering of Jesus. How, what this cost him to go to the cross. And uh, the disciples are already showing signs of their inability to be supportive to him in this. And so he's very much alone in this hour and experiencing himself as being uh, forsaken. We see the same thing in the Synoptic Gospels depiction of the crucifixion, where Jesus cries out in anguish, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, and so we, we have a, a Jesus who is suffering in these last days. The passion and death is exacting a, a, a huge toll on him. John's picture is somewhat different. In John, there is no uh, uh, wrestling in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Jesus goes to the garden with his disciples, um, but there's no mention of them praying or the disciples falling asleep or anything. There's none of that. Instead, uh, Jesus uh, sees the lights coming from, the, uh, from his betrayer and from the soldiers, and he goes out to meet the crowd. And he, uh, he offers himself to the soldiers and identifies himself. I am he, ego I may. And all of the soldiers fall down out of fear. And uh, Jesus is very much in charge. He initiates the contact with this group that has come to arrest him. And uh, he goes off willingly. He, he rebukes uh, Peter for trying to defend him with a sword. And he, he uh, willingly hands himself over to the authorities. He does ask that they allow his disciples to, to, uh, to go free. And he does this because he's the good shepherd and he's protecting his flock. But he himself is about to lay down his life for the sheep. Uh, so now, does that mean that one account is right and the other is wrong? Or, uh, perhaps it means that we need to hear both of these accounts. We need to realize the cost of Jesus' passion and death. And at the same time, we need to realize, as John would have us realize, that Jesus' life is not taken from him. Uh, the Romans and uh, the uh, Jewish leaders, the opponents of Jesus, do not have power over him. He willingly lays down his life for the sheep uh, as the good shepherd. Uh, he lays down his life in order to take it up again. This is part of his movement in glory. He's going to be lifted up on the cross uh, so that those uh, who uh, look to him uh, will be saved. So uh, we uh, enter into the account here in John, recognizing that it's quite a different account than what we might be uh, familiar with from the synoptics, and we'll see several key differences. The first difference is that uh, Jesus is uh, arrested uh, in the manner that we just described, and he is brought to the, to the home of the high priest. Now, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see uh, the Sanhedrin gathering, the elders and the chief priests are there at the, at the high priest's home and in the courtyard and things, and they're gathering uh, in order to test and try Jesus. And so he will be interrogated there by Caiaphas, the high priest. John's gospel has a much a simpler scene. There is no, um, uh, he, Jesus is brought uh, to the high priest's house, but he doesn't meet with Caiaphas there, he instead is interrogated by Annas. Annas is the father-in-law of uh, Caiaphas and was himself a high priest. And the purpose of this um, interrogation from Annas is, uh, is to try to get Jesus to admit to um, 
how revolutionary his teachings are and to get him to verbalize something that they can use in the charge uh, to accuse him of blasphemy. But uh, in typical Johannine uh, fashion, uh, Annas is not really in charge of this interrogation. Jesus is supremely self-confident as he stands before Annas. And, um, and it's Annas that's really being put on trial here rather than uh, Jesus. So um, in, this, in this dialogue, Jesus easily outpoints Annas uh, in, the, in the dialogue. And the interrogation leaves Annas, not Jesus, with the embarrassing and unanswered questions. So uh, uh, unlike the synoptic account, um, Jesus here appearing before Annas and then being uh, handed on um, uh, to Caiaphas and then on to Pilate, but no mention of Caiaphas interrogating or investigating Jesus. Now, in this uh, scene at the high priest's house, uh, we have uh, Simon Peter. At the same time that Jesus is uh, proclaiming his innocence, Simon Peter is proving his weakness. Uh, Simon Peter is outside and he is invited into the courtyard where he three times uh, refuses to acknowledge that he knows Jesus and that he is one of Jesus' followers. Three times he's asked, uh, uh, you're with this man, aren't you? And three times he denies it. There is also in this scene uh, another figure. <laughs> Um, let's look at uh, chapter 18, uh, verse 15. Simon Peter and another disciple, and this is presumably the disciple whom Jesus loved, who has been named before at the Last Supper, is the one leaning against the breast of Jesus. So Simon Peter and another disciple, it doesn't mention here that he is the disciple whom Jesus loved, but that's whom scholars uh, assume that uh, uh, John is talking about here. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus, that is from the arrest in the garden up to the high priest's uh, uh, dwelling. So since that disciple, that unnamed disciple, that another disciple here, uh, since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So this other disciple that is with Peter is known to the high priest. He's a person of high status in, in Jerusalem, and he's known to the high priest. And so he can gain access himself to the courtyard. Peter is a poor fisherman from Galilee. He can't get in. He's out in outside of the, of the courtyard, outside of the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. And here the woman asks Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And Peter says, I am not. And that scene repeats itself two more times. So here we have this other disciple, not named again, uh, presumably the disciple whom Jesus loved, who has co some connection and tie with the high priest. He's able to go out and facilitate um, Peter's entry into the courtyard itself. Um, so we have uh, uh, the other disciple, this beloved disciple, presumably, um, um, a citizen with some connections and uh, some status. He's probably not one of the 12, even though he's invited to be at the Last Supper with Jesus. And we'll see him several more times as the story progresses. This beloved disciple is a key disciple at the Last Supper. Here at the process of Jesus, uh, as he faces uh, Annas, this beloved disciple will also appear at the foot of the cross during the crucifixion. He will also be a part of the resurrection narratives in John 
20 and 21. So uh, he plays a very key role from this point on in the last days. And this is the disciple who is the inspiration for the Gospel of John. He may have been the author, but he is certainly the inspiration. It's his witness, it's his testimony, it's his theological understanding that has shaped this gospel. There's a community of Christians that have grown up around him, and uh, he, for them, is their authority and is the primary interpreter and eyewitness who can testify to Jesus. And in John's gospel, he's kind of set against Peter. Peter, obviously, was a key uh, disciple and uh, and also the one to whom Jesus presents the keys of the kingdom. So he's, he's the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. That's what the synoptic gospels tell us. But in contrast to that Petrine uh, Christian community, there's this Johannine community, which follows the teaching and example and the witness and testimony of the eyewitness, uh, uh, the beloved disciple, this disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the inspiration behind this gospel. So we have, um, um, we have here, uh, um, the, the gospel writer is vouching for this, uh, for this uh, figure, this other disciple, to say that he is a reliable and a trustworthy um, uh, authority. And uh, it, is, it is his witness that has shaped their message. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll see this contrast playing out. It played out a little bit already at the Last Supper when the beloved disciple was positioned near to Jesus. And Peter, who wanted to know who was going to betray him, had to ask the beloved disciple to relay his question to Jesus. And so we have a picture of the beloved disciple being the one that was closer to Jesus at the Last Supper. So now, after the uh, interrogation by Annas, which doesn't prove to be too taxing for Jesus, he seems completely in control, he is then brought before Pilate. And in the Synoptic Gospels, the trial before Pilate is quite different. Uh, Pilate interrogates Jesus, and Jesus stands silent before him. He doesn't answer him. And uh, so we have a very different uh, picture of this in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, Pilate is interrogating Jesus, and there are no accusers around. There's no uh, uh, chief priests or, or scribes or elders who are present uh, when this interrogation is going on. In John's Gospel, we have a slightly different scene, and here, we have Jesus brought into the inner quarters of Pontius Pilate, where he is interrogated by Pilate. And outside in the courtyard are the, the, the Jews, as they are called, the chief priests, the, priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, uh, Jesus' opponents, Jesus' accusers are outside. And they can't come in because uh, that would uh, violate them according to the purity standards. And so they have to remain outside. And as a result, we see a drama where a pilot goes back and forth. He comes indoors to talk with Jesus and to ask him questions. Then he goes outdoors to dialogue with the crowd that's gathered out there and to try to uh, bargain with them. And we see Pilate uh, almost uh, like a chameleon here, uh, changing as he goes back and forth from the inside to the outside. In the inside, he's impressed with Jesus, and he doesn't find cause to condemn Jesus. He, uh, uh, Jesus eloquently defends himself, and Pilate believes in his innocence. But when he goes outside, the 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 crowd is angry, and they're calling for his death. And so Pilate finds himself in a very difficult situation. He believes Jesus to be innocent, but he also has to placate this crowd that is insisting on Jesus' crucifixion. 
So we have a back and forth uh, kind of drama going on uh, with several uh, conversations of, with Jesus and then with the crowd and then with Jesus again and then with the crowd. And finally, uh, uh, at the, the culmination of this uh, back and forth drama is that a pilot uh, takes Jesus and has him whipped. Uh, he is mocked and scourged. He is, uh, a, a crown of thorns is placed on his head, a purple robe around him to uh, indicate that he is a king. And he is uh, brought out uh, outside um, in front of the crowd. And this uh, enrages the crowd even further, and they're shouting for his crucifixion. They want, they want Pilate to release Barabbas, the thief, rather than to release Jesus. And they, they won't be satisfied until uh, Jesus is put to death. So the interesting thing about the conversation between Pilate and Jesus in the fourth gospel is that it's not really Jesus who's on trial. Jesus is completely in control of himself and of his own destiny. It's actually Pilate who's on trial because uh, Jesus is, is, knows, he says, uh, you know, you know that I'm innocent, but uh, do you have the courage to uh, to act justly and to and to set me free, or are you going to give in to this mob uh, and and uh, just satisfy their wishes in order to uh, avoid further trouble? And so, uh, whether Pilate will stand up for the truth or not is a real question here. And so, in a sense, it's Pilate on trial uh, rather than Jesus. So we uh, see in chapter. 8 verse uh, 36 um, and 37, um, now Pilate has asked him if he's the king of the Jews. And Jesus answers, my kingdom is not from this world. My followers would be fighting, if my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so are you a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate says, what is truth? So we have Jesus here. Uh, the accusation is that he is the king of the Jews and Pilate wants to explore this threat to his, the rule of the Romans, and he asks him plainly if he is a king. But Jesus says, no, I'm not, a, you can call me a king if you want, but that I didn't come into the world to be a king. Uh, I'm not interested in worldly uh, kingships. Uh, instead, I've come in to, to declare the truth. And, uh, and we realize that uh, Pilate is on, on trial here, whether he will uh, stick with what he believes to be true or whether he will compromise his own integrity by giving in to the crowd. Now, Jesus tells him uh, that uh, in spite of what he may think, he has no real authority over Jesus. And, um, um, and so it is not, it's not Jesus who's afraid of Pilate here. Uh, Jesus is in control of his own destiny. Uh, he knows what's happening. And, um, and it's actually Pilate who is afraid of Jesus, especially when he hears that Jesus is referred to as the Son of God. That puts terror in his heart. So the real question here is not what will happen to Jesus, who's in charge of his own destiny, but whether Pilate himself will bow to the outcry of the very people that he's supposed to be governing. Uh, in the end, Pilate uh, saves face by uh, getting the Jews uh, to profess uh, uh, allegiance uh, to Caesar. And, um, and we, we see that Pilate has failed to bear witness to the truth as he has uh, 
has come to it. So uh, this is slightly different again from the synoptic gospels. Uh, in John's gospel, Jesus is mocked and scourged as part of this interrogation before uh, Pilate, and he is brought out to the crowd and shown to them. And Pilate says, "Here is, here's the man. Here is your king." And it it drives home the fact that uh, the Jews are not willing to accept him as uh, their king. And instead, they profess that they would prefer uh, the reign of Caesar over the, uh, the reign of Jesus. In the Synoptic uh, Gospels, uh, it's slightly different. In the, in the Synoptic Gospels, there's the trial before Pilate, and then Jesus is sentenced to death. And then he is uh, scourged and mocked and uh, the robe is put about him and stuff, and then he is uh, uh, led off uh, to, the, to the cross. Um, so it comes at the end of the trial. Here in John's Gospel, it's actually part of the trial, and the sentence hasn't been delivered yet when Jesus is presented before the people uh, dressed in a purple robe and a crown of thorns. In, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, Simon of Cyrene, is enlisted to help uh, carry the cross. And we see that here is suffering Jesus. Uh, he has been whipped and beaten, is uh, presumably weak from the loss of blood. And so Simon is inscripted to, to uh, come and uh, carry the cross for him. But in John's gospel, uh, Jesus is willing to carry his own cross, which uh, simply underscores again that he is willingly laying down his life for the sheep and that his life is not being taken from, from him. Um, the, the harshness of the cry of the people in John's Gospel is, uh, almost takes our breath away. And it's, it's, we feel this when we read John's narrative uh, at the Palm Sunday liturgy and again at the Good Friday liturgy. We hear, uh, well, sorry, we hear, we read the synoptic uh, version of the, of the Passion at the Palm Sunday and uh, John's version of the Passion um, at uh, Good Friday. Uh, but both uh, times were startled by these words uh, shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And John's, um, John's uh, setting up of this drama uh, is particularly, um, particularly um, shocking. Now, I want to, once again to visit this term, the Jews, um, in the fourth gospel. Um, this, is, this, this tension that we feel between the followers of Jesus and the Jews, uh, as they're referred to here in the gospel, is the tension that reflects uh, a, a conflict that is coming uh, uh, to a head at the end of the first century. So this is the gospel writer's uh, dilemma. Uh, he, the, he, he's writing for a community and from a community that has experienced real persecution at the hand of the Jews. And uh, they have been put out of the synagogue. And because they, the Jews have dissociated them and uh, sent them away from the synagogue, forbidden them to come to the synagogue, uh, they are in a very vulnerable position. The Romans had grown to tolerate the Jews but these people now are no longer identified with the Jews, and so they are susceptible to uh, uh, Romans uh, investigating them and charging them with uh, things. And so um, they've experienced uh, persecution, and we have to realize that this apparently hostile language about the Jews is rooted in this late first century dynamic. There's a real tension between John's community and between the, the synagogue and the Jews who have not received uh, Jesus. So uh, even though there are places in the New Testament, for example, in 1 Thessalonians, where the, uh, the writer says the Jews 
uh, killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. So the fault is laid upon the Jews in other places as well. But here John is, is by far the clearest voice with this message of uh, criticizing and blaming the Jews for Jesus' death. Now, unfortunately, Christians have sometimes picked up on that call and uh, engaged in anti-Semitic acts on the basis of their belief that uh, the Jews were responsible for Jesus' death. But um, this is reflecting a, a, a first century uh, conflict and it has nothing uh, to say about our own uh, treatment and relationship with the Jews. Raymond Brown, the famous Johannine scholar, says the context of mutual hostility between the Johannine community and the synagogue must be taken into account when proclaiming the Johannine passion narrative in the Good Friday liturgy. So we always have to make people aware of this uh, historical context and that this language reflects a, a real tension that was true at the end of the first century. It's not meant to be a condemnation of Judaism, of the Jews. Uh, uh, it is simply uh, um, a reflection of the tension of the times. The trial uh, before Pilate ends with um, the priests, in effect, denying their messianic hopes. Uh, they do not want Jesus to be their king, and they state their preference for the emperor. And uh, so Pilate then hands over Jesus uh, to be crucified. In all four of the Gospels, uh, mention is made of the sign that is posted on the cross above Jesus that uh, designates him as the King of the Jews. Um, but it's especially poignant in John's Gospel because we've just heard the uh, Jews denying that he is the King of the Jews and preferring the Emperor. Uh, but here, uh, John makes a point of stating that this message was posted over Jesus, saying that he was the king of the Jews, and that it was posted in all the major languages of that period in that time. It was posted in Latin and Hebrew and Greek. And uh, so, um, in a way, Pilate is underscoring what the Jews don't recognize, that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Uh, and here we have the representative of the greatest power in the world at that time, affirming that Jesus is the king and putting it up in a public place where every passerby would read that. The Jews object to this uh, sign, but uh, uh, John uh, makes mention of it because it underscores uh, his belief that the Jews have missed out on, uh, on their own Messiah's coming. In the, uh, in the Gospels, uh, Reference is made to uh, the soldiers dividing Jesus' garment. Uh, John likewise has this reference. He focuses on the seamless tunic, uh, which may be an allusion to the seamless tunic that the high priest wore. And if it is, then it, it reflects that Jesus is not only a king, but he's also the priest. He has a priestly role. And, uh, uh, but it's not clear exactly what the meaning of this is. The seamless tunic could be a symbol of unity, for example. Uh, in Matthew and Mark, uh, there's a tradition that the women followed Jesus as he was taken to the cross but they followed from a distance and they watched the scene of him being nailed to the cross and crucified from a distance. The disciples are nowhere to be found. They, are, they have fled and they are hiding. They are not even at the scene uh, or, or witnessing the scene even from afar. In uh, John's Gospel, we have a different account because here several women uh, are at the cross, at the foot of the cross itself when Jesus is crucified, including Jesus' mother and including the disciple whom Jesus loved. And here in John's Gospel, we have that 
uh, that touching story of Jesus presenting his mother to the beloved disciple and the beloved disciple to, to his mother. And from that day on, the gospel writer tells us, uh, the beloved disciple took Mary into his home and uh, was her protector and advocate. So Jesus uh, leaves his mother in the care of the beloved disciple. And uh, this is mostly, uh, this scene is, uh, these are historical characters, they're real characters in the narrative, but the scene is, is more concerned really with their symbolism. Because what's happening here for John is, this is the establishment of the Johannine community. This is where the church begins with the beloved disciple and Mary being given to one another. So community is formed, the church is born, the Johannine community uh, uh, begins to uh, grow from this moment. So it's a very powerful symbol for John uh, to, to uh, account, uh, include in his account, this giving of Mary to John and, uh, and John taking on the responsibility. Uh, in chapter 19, verse 29 and 30, we read that a sponge full of common wine is placed on hyssop and offered to Jesus. Now, uh, this, is, this is, again, a little contrast with the synoptic account. In the synoptic account, the sponge is placed on a reed. In uh, John's account, the sponge is placed on hyssop. And... Uh, uh, Actually, the reed is the better instrument. It's, a, it's stronger and straighter. And so that's a likely answer. Hyssop was more fern-like and would not have been an appropriate uh, uh, instrument to attach a sponge to and lift it up to the cross. And, uh, but John has, take, has called it hyssop for a very specific reason. He's making use of symbolism here uh, because in Exodus 12, verse 22, Hyssop was used, this fern-like plant was used to sprinkle the blood of the Paschal lamb on the doorposts of the Israelite houses uh, as they're preparing to, uh, to leave uh, Egypt. So uh, in, in John's gospel, he, he says it's hyssop uh, that the sponge is placed on and lifted to Jesus' mouth. But he's recalling this uh, earlier account in Exodus of, uh, of the sprinkling of blood on the doorposts of the Israelites. And, uh, and John is also uh, uh, making it clear that Jesus is sentenced to death at noon. Uh, the very hour when the, the Passover lambs would be slaughtered in the temple. And he does this to connect back to what he has said already in the first chapter, where John testified to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So here John is using that imagery and portraying Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so the fact that the lambs are being slaughtered in the temple at the very moment when Jesus is being condemned to death is significant for John. Um, even Jesus' cry on the cross where he cries out, I thirst, uh, is, is not so much uh, uh, an indication of his suffering, but notice that he says, I thirst, only when, uh, John says, when he knew that all was now finished and in order to fulfill the scriptures. So here is Jesus. Even his cry of, I thirst, is not really uh, uh, so much about his suffering as it is about, uh, John says, uh, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. It's a sign that he has accomplished what he uh, uh, came to accomplish here and, um, and that it is finished. And so to fulfill the scripture, Jesus says, I thirst. And uh, likewise, when he uh, declares, it is finished, and hands over his spirit, once again, we have Jesus 
willingly laying down his life. It is finished. This, uh, the laying down of my life, it is finished, he says, just before he dies. And he hands over his spirit. John even says uh, uh, he bows his head and hands over his spirit, which is a real, uh, really consistent with John's theology here. The fourth gospel insists that the spirit can't come and uh, doesn't come until after Jesus is crucified. And so the first mention of the coming of the spirit is actually on the eve, uh, on the Sunday night of Jesus' resurrection. So in a couple of days, he's resurrected from the dead. And that Sunday evening, he appears to the disciples in the upper room and he breathes on them and gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's John's Pentecost there. The giving of the Holy Spirit is Jesus breathing the Spirit on his disciples. And this has been enabled because he has um, been glorified. He's been lifted up and his glorification means that the Spirit can now be released. Uh, Jesus um, uh, dies in this um, kind of sovereign and uh, dignified uh, way here. Uh, and these traits are, are true not only of his dying, but also um, his, his burial. Uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, at the moment of Jesus' death, there are miraculous signs. The temple uh, curtain is torn in two, and there are earthquakes, and there are um, um, there, the tombs are opened, and bodies of, of the saints come out of their tombs. Uh, a Roman centurion uh, sees what is happening, the dark skies and the, the thunder, and he comes to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. That's a synoptic account. But in John, the focus is on Jesus' body. And John records that uh, the Roman soldiers pierce Jesus' side, and from his side comes water and blood. Now, we, we recall when we hear that water comes from his side, we recall uh, what was said earlier of him in John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39, said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. And now his side is pierced and water comes forth. And the fact that it's commingled with blood is a sign that his sacrifice uh, has been completed, a sign that Jesus has passed from this world uh, to the Father, and uh, he has been glorified. Um, some, uh, some people also see in this mingling of the water and the blood from Jesus' side uh, an allusion to baptism and Eucharist, which are the primary ways in which the community experiences the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is communicated through the Eucharist and through the sacrament of baptism. And finally, there's the burial. In uh, uh, all four Gospels, uh, the burial is mentioned, but John uses it once more to uh, express the sovereignty of Jesus. Jesus uh, is a king. And um, Jesus has laid down his life, and John uh, sees him buried as a king. In John's Gospel, we have Nicodemus, uh, who is a Johannine character. We won't find him in the synoptics, but we, we heard from him when he came to question Jesus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus is one of the ones who comes now to bury him. And the other is Joseph of Arimathea, who is also mentioned in the synoptic Gospels. And together they ask for Jesus' body and they take it to the tomb. And uh, it mentions that Nicodemus comes with a, a huge amount of spices, a staggering amount of myrrh and aloes, a hundred pounds worth of it, and uh, far more than what was needed. But the idea is extravagance, and the idea is this is a king being buried. And so an extraordinary amount of myrrh and aloes are used to bind his body and to uh, um, uh, prepare him for burial. 
So throughout the, the whole uh, of John's account of the Passion and the Crucifixion, uh, we see this consistent message that uh, in John's view, um, the Passion is the Passion of a sovereign King who has come, uh, who has overcome the world. Um, Jesus is, uh, is fully in charge throughout this whole process. He willingly lays down his life. He hands over his life in the crucifixion and he is lifted up and um, uh, to draw all people to himself and he is glorified and the Father is glorified in his crucifixion as much as in his resurrection. So next week will be our final session together and we will look at the, the resurrection narratives in John chapter 20 and 21. And we thank you again for uh, being faithful partners for us with us in this study and I uh, hope you have a blessed week.